Welcome to the TCO Method, the only show focused on helping you massively increase your net operating income. I am Andy McQuaid. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today, we're going to go back to operations. We're going to talk about something that, for whatever reason, has been a hot topic on LinkedIn for the last, I don't know, a week, maybe? For those of you who don't know, I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn networking with people in real estate, commercial real estate mostly. Um, and for whatever reason, this particular item has been a hot topic this week. I don't know why. So it's going to be appliances today. I'm thinking about calling the episode appliances to be or not to be. That is the question. And not just because I'm cheesy and love to just use random titles, but the reality is that depending on what type of investing you're doing, appliances and providing them is a major factor. We're not providing them, which we'll get into a little bit. So I guess the first qualifier I need to throw out there is I used to sell a lot of appliances. And by a lot, I mean millions of dollars a year that I was responsible for. So when I was at the Big Orange Box, I dealt with somewhere between 25 and 40 property management firms, depending on what year it was and what my focus was and all that. But in between 2015 and 2018, when I exited, I was working with mostly large buy and hold value add commercial multifamily operators. And so one of the things that I was able to figure out and do well was providing the appliances for apartment complexes. So I would utilize the programs that we had in place and I would help them coordinate their buying power, their buying volume versus buying them direct. This is not a sales pitch for the big orange box or the big blue box or any of the other ones out there. What happened between 2015 and 2018 is not necessarily able to be reproduced today. I speak from personal experience. So I had one client spending over $3 million a year with me. I had another client spending a couple million a year with me. And we were putting appliances into apartment complexes in six different states. I had clients with properties in 17. But really, I got involved in the larger projects when they were doing a value-add rehab. So I would provide those appliances for them. I would negotiate with the manufacturer to get them a special price that was significantly more attractive than what would normally be offered by using the big orange box or going to a pro desk or being purchased directly from the manufacturer. So domestic branded appliances, we would do everything that the mom and pops would do. We would obviously take their money, place the order, get the truck there, have the guys open the appliances at the back of the truck, bring them into the unit. If they didn't open them in the truck, they would open them in the unit, take the boxes off, take the garbage out of the unit. They would not make final connections. They would just set them up and get them ready to be pushed into place and connected. And we were cheaper than buying it direct. We were cheaper than doing the work yourself. We were cheaper than going to a mom and pop. We were cheaper than whatever. And it was the exact same appliance. There was no, there's no, there are certain products made for box stores that are specifically offered only at box stores because they have cheaper parts inside. Appliances are not one of those things. 
unless something has changed, whether you go to a local mom and pop or a big orange box or whatever, typically the supply chain is relatively the same. You buy a whatever brand refrigerator of model number X, and it's exactly the same across all of them. No big deal. So now that I've qualified the appliance thing, there's really a few key things I want to talk about because there's the question, especially in smaller multifamily, right? Non-commercial multifamily, so six or fewer doors. And I guess it depends on the state, right? Each state actually has its own legal definition of what commercial multifamily is. Some states, it's four or more. Some states, it's five or more. Some, it's six or more. Some, it's 10 or 12 or more. The legal definition is not really what I'm talking about. I consider commercial real estate named apartment complexes, whether they're garden apartments, whether they're towers, whether they're mid-rises, it, it doesn't matter. If it has a name for the community, I consider that commercial multifamily. If it's just a 6 or a 12 or a 10 that's just randomly located someplace, I don't consider that commercial. I consider that small small multifamily. Relevant for this conversation, that specific naming convention, but what I want to really focus on is three things. One, how do you qualify what brand or model number of appliance that you want to use? Two, do you provide appliances at all? Commercial multifamily, the answer is 99.95% of the time, absolutely yes, with one exception that we'll get into. And three, and this really doesn't apply to commercial multifamily, but I've seen it done and it's terrible. Do you buy used or do you buy new? So most of my large clients were and still are value add multifamily operators. Sometimes it's buy and hold. Sometimes it's buy, value add, lease up, almost complete the work, and then sell it with meat on the bone. When you're choosing appliances, the first thing that people think of is, other than cost, Curb appeal. What does this look like in my unit? You walk into an apartment that has almond or off-white or whatever they called their color at the time, appliances, and you know it's dated. Because I couldn't even order an almond appliance after like 2016. So you know it's not going anywhere. You also have to watch out for appliances that are a flash in the pan, right? They come out one year like black stainless. Black stainless was sharp. However, have you tried to find a replacement appliance that matches? Probably not. So for your curb appeal standpoint, again, this is not just a conversation about how do I make this look pretty. It's a conversation about what am I going to be able to put my hands on five or seven years from now that's still going to be available that matches the other units in here so I'm not replacing three or four appliances at once when only one of them dies and I'm ready to, to, to put that unit on the market and lease it again. Black stainless ain't that one, let me tell you. And I had a couple clients who insisted they needed it. And right now, they're dealing with trying to find something that matches. So what they're doing is they're putting either black or regular stainless suites of appliances into other units and stealing working appliances from other apartments and moving stuff around to try and get it all to work. And it's a nightmare. So... 
let's just qualify the curb appeal side. Pick colors that will still be available and still look good in that unit when one dies or when you're ready to turn it and do a make ready and get, get a new tenant in. That leaves black, white, and good old-fashioned stainless. Probably not clean steel. There's been real availability issues, issues with clean steel, and the untrained eye can't really tell the difference, but it is very apparent what the difference is once you actually get into it. So, now that we've talked about the curb appeal side, while you're looking at availability, you have to look at the repairability. There are plenty of inexpensive import brands of appliances out there on the market. I will tell you from personal experience that the challenge remains with all of those manufacturers being able to repair that unit when it goes down. Now, for something like a fridge, hopefully you have the availability to have one sitting around in the boneyard or in a shop, in storage, in a garage, somewhere. So you can make the swap in the middle of the night if you need to. So your tenant's not putting a claim in against their renter's insurance for a faulty fridge and ruining all their food in their freezer. Hopefully. Not everybody does, right? People who are listening to this are going to have scattered sites. They don't really have a place to keep an extra fridge or an extra stove, or an extra whatever. And that's fine. Really, when you look at it, you only really need the fridge. Because if they have a stove, whether it works or not, they're, they, they're not going to starve, right? They can't cook, but they're not going to starve. Same thing if the microwave goes down. Same thing if the dishwasher goes down. You have hands, and a sponge, and a sink. As long as those are all working, you can wash your own dishes. I digress. But when you're looking at making a choice, right, you want to align with a vendor or a brand or both for ease of use, for ease of repair, for predictability, for buying power. You don't want to just buy whatever happens to be on sale because it's cheap. Well, a lot of those. Cheap import, even if they look pretty, stainless, fancy, all the bells and whistles, tablets built in, right? Touchscreen tablets built into the doors. Anybody who's ever worked in property management and used those has learned very quickly that getting them fixed is almost impossible. Even before the pandemic you couldn't get them fixed in a reasonable amount of time. People were getting quoted three to six months for parts. You can't not have a working fridge for three to six months. Are you kidding me? What is that? Just throwing things out by the curb. Bells and whistles, as cool as they are, need to be looked at as potential points of failure when you're considering your appliances. If you're in an A-plus luxury apartment complex and you're putting in Viking and Sub-Zero products, this probably isn't a conversation for you because they don't really suffer those issues. Bells and whistles are expected and they have a strong repair network to take care of them when they happen. But for consumer brand appliances, that you would walk into a box store or a mom and pop shop or find online to get delivered, you need to be considering what is the availability of repairing this thing? And what is it going to cost me if it goes sideways? Right? You need to look at the quality reviews. Most of them are fake now, so it's really hard. So you need to talk to your peers, right? We talked about discussing with your network and leveraging your network to find out about other people. You need to find out about the products they're using as well. 
right? Not just about the vendors they use, not just about who's trustworthy to do business with and who's not. You need to be talking to them about products. Well, what brand of appliance are you using? And not every answer is going to be qualified from a position of authority or knowledge. A lot of people do things just because they've always done them that way without ever thinking about or looking at the long-term impact on their business. It's literally what I get paid to do is to show these people all the stuff that they're not looking at that costs them money that they don't even know or is costing them money. Nobody lights money on fire because they think it's fun. They do it because they don't know they're doing it. They've never thought further down the road and they don't have a strategy for how they deal or how they manage their purchasing and procurement, product selection, and all the other stuff. You need to avoid things that are going to cost you money. In C&B apartments, if you are putting up water to your ice makers, water dispensers in the doors of your appliances, you are doing it wrong. The chances of failure escalate insanely high, insanely fast when you have plumbing connections made to those types of fixtures. Because the first time that tenant pulls that refrigerator out from the wall, and doesn't know that the water connection, or doesn't think about the water connection to that little tiny plastic elbow on the back top corner of the fridge, or bottom of the fridge, depending on which one it is, they're going to snap that tiny plastic elbow off. Or they're going to pull the pipe out, and it's just going to piss water all over your floor. You know, tenants downstairs are going to be real unhappy real fast. So, how do you avoid it? No ice makers, no water. Sorry, buy bagged ice, get a countertop ice maker, do something, but don't, don't provide that for them, right? That's not something you want to do. You really shouldn't even be allowing them to do countertop dishwashers and countertop ice makers because. That's just huge, huge potential for things to go sideways. But people will still do it, no matter what's in the lease. So, repairability is a thing. Parts availability is a thing. Having a qualified repair network is a thing. When you look up a brand of appliance, look up their support network. Make a couple phone calls. Hey. How far are you guys out on getting parts for this XYZ refrigerator with an iPad in the door? I think you'll be very unhappy with the answers you hear. Buy a domestic brand. Even though one of the domestic brands isn't really domestic anymore because it's owned by a company from China. Most of their manufacturing is still here and they still have a very strong support network. Leveraging your buying power for appliances, as a side note, if you're buying direct, you're probably losing your shirt. I say that from experience because they break up all of the different properties and all the different projects as different customers. It doesn't matter if they're all owned by one massive corporation and they're all operated by one massive property management firm, they won't give you the pricing that you should have for that whole corporation as one entity. They will break up the pricing based on utilization for each individual 
property separately. That's how I got the business at the big orange box. Is I would take all of their properties and pull them into one giant client. Because that's how I treated them. And then I would take all of the different models of appliances that they needed. And all of the annual usage for those replacement appliances or what I knew was coming on projects. And I would put them all on a contract and I would lock their price for a year. Did you even know that was a thing? Probably not. Can you still do it? Good luck. Once you've gotten past the selection stuff, right? Avoid the stupid bells and whistles. Pick a brand that has available repairability. Then you got to look at, do I want to buy used or new? In a large multifamily operation, the only used appliances, in my opinion, that should be used are the ones that you take out of a unit where you're replacing it and getting it repaired, putting it downstairs. Because you controlled it when it was new. You know what was wrong with it. You know everything that happened to it. You took it out of an apartment because it stopped working. Put it in your shop, put it in your boneyard, have the repair guy fix it there while the replacement appliance is up in the unit, whether that one was another one that you fixed prior or a new one that matches the old one. What that does for you is it allows you to keep matching product, number one, so your curb appeal doesn't shift, right? You can tell when you walk into an apartment when it's a mishmash of different years and different brands of appliances that it just doesn't look great. You'll walk in and you'll see a hot point fridge, and you'll see a Maytag dishwasher, and you'll see a Whirlpool range or a Frigidaire range, and then you'll see a Magic Chef microwave. Yeah, they're all black, but they don't really align. And maybe that's okay in a C unit, right? Especially when it's changed hands a bunch of times and had a bunch of different operators there and hasn't really had a value add rehab done. But when you're going for long term curb appeal, when you're going for long term viability, reusing your old stuff is intelligent, it's smart, and it's good for your business. Now, does that mean you want to keep those almond appliances in the, in the mix? Only if you have to. Honestly, like if you've done a partial rehab and you still have some units where people didn't want to move, you couldn't bribe them to, to go to a newly refurbished unit to, so you could get into theirs. It, it, it kind of is what it is. Maybe you need one, maybe you don't. Keep it running. But the reality is that most of the time you're going to want to put new appliances in. And there's probably people listening who are like, I use used appliance showrooms all the time and I love them and I don't ever have any issues and blah, blah, blah. Reality of it is that I've run the numbers six ways from Sunday and I not once have ever run into a situation where used appliances have worked out long term from a cost standpoint. You can put a new Strippo, no bells and whistles appliance into a C unit with a full warranty and it works out to last longer and operate better and have less issues than the used appliances that have been refurbed by mom and pop locally every single time. Not once has anybody actually put it on paper, compared it side by side with real service numbers, real length of use, and had it work out. There's a ton of anecdotal out there, but when you actually ask for the proof in writing, like, okay, show me all of the places you've installed used appliances across all your properties. Install dates, in-service dates, and disposal dates when they stop functioning or need a repair. And all the repair work orders and all of the costs incurred to manage those things. 
and it looks a lot like the battery operated smoke detector that you have to put nine volt batteries in or double A batteries in that you're in every year doing something to that's costing you money, costing you labor. And yet, we still have that conversation. So it shouldn't really surprise me or disappoint me that we're having a conversation about appliances in the same way. And there's always the chance that you buy a new appliance and you get a bad run. I had a client who bought, I don't know, 120 refrigerators from a reputable domestic brand. And they all had bad timers. And there was a lot of work involved in getting the manufacturer to acknowledge that the timers were all bad. And then to provide the parts. They didn't even want to provide the labor. It was still within the one year parts and labor. They didn't want to provide the labor. Because it was 120 appliances. It made me very cranky. But it happens. Luckily, it was an inexpensive part that once the person learned how to do it, it was a 15 minute fix. But it still costs a lot of money to do. Now, luckily, the complex was under construction and there were already guys in the units. So the additional cost to make it right in 95% of cases was very low. It was the extra 15 minutes to swap the part. But the reality is they shouldn't have had to do it. And it was pre-pandemic. There was no excuse for not being able to provide the labor at that point. Anyway, if you want to know who it was, podcast at tcomethod.com. Send me an email. I will be glad to share. Anyway. If the numbers work, they work. But I've never once seen it work out where a used appliance works out better than a new. You don't have to put a $1,000 range self-cleaning glass topped monstrosity in to replace a used four burner coil electric with no window. Like that's not at all a fair comparison. But if you compare a new stripped down range to a used range, those new stripped down ranges will outlast them every day. Same thing with refrigerators, same thing with microwaves. The reality is that components have a useful life inside these devices. And it's the major components that take the wear and tear that are not replaced in the refurb process. Like you buy a refurbed range, they change Maybe the coils, right? The burners. And maybe they change the igniter if it's gas. But they're not changing the electronics, the circuit boards, the stuff that's really expensive to fix that's a deal breaker. It's not part of the refurb process. You can refurb a stove for a hundred bucks. Replace the drip pans, put in new coils, put in new wiring harnesses if they've melted, clean the oven. It's not rocket science. The next thing that I want to discuss is the question of do you or do you not provide appliances? And for some smaller operators, the answer is no. And I'm going to call that into question for a couple of reasons. One is, if you're in a market where appliances are typically optional and the availability for you to generate more net operating income by charging them for providing appliances is there, why would you not? And I say this, again, based on experience. You can make more money by providing the appliances. You can also reduce your risk. What do you mean? I have to fix those appliances if they go wrong. This is why we don't use used appliances, Junior. Okay? You'll spend a lot less time repairing them if you're buying 
strip o new appliances versus used ones with 30 day warranties. Just throwing that out there. The other risk avoidance thing that you're putting in the mix is everybody needs appliances. Do you really think that your tenants are going to be super duper extra careful to not bang into the walls and baseboards and door frames while they're moving appliances in and out of that place they rented from you? How much does it cost to fix that? I don't care about your security deposit. Because if you're to the point of having to keep their security deposit to make up from the damages, you're already losing. Because very rarely does a security deposit actually cover the amount of damage these people do when they're hard on a unit. But I want to talk about your security deposit and how that's all taken care of. If they're moving appliances in and out of your house, in and out of your apartment, in and out of your building, Something's going to go wrong. They're going to tear a hole in the floor. They're going to scratch or gouge the floor. They're going to dent the door frame. They're going to put a hole in the drywall. They're going to snap off a bump stop on a door. They're going to snap off a something. Something's going to go bad. Maybe just avoid the issue completely by providing the appliance and charging for it. Again. Where does it work out in your favor over time? Everybody who says that they've never had an issue or it's a minor issue that happens once in a while has never really done the process costing, the risk analysis, the cost-benefit analysis, whatever label you want to put on it, they've never actually put it on paper and tracked it. Because if they did... If it wasn't just anecdotal and living on cash flow, they would see that it doesn't work out in their favor in the long run. Avoid the issues. Opportunity cost is real. Put your capital to work where it will make you more capital. Don't just light money on fire because you've always done it that way. You need to change how you're thinking about these things. The other part about generating extra NOI by providing appliances where you can in markets where you can, right, where it's not expected to just be part of the rent is in unit laundry, right? You have, you have options depending on what type of building it is and whatever. So around 2015 or 2016, my clients, my biggest clients, when I was at the Big Orange Box, started doing in-unit laundry as part of their value-add rehabs. And they would charge whatever extra per month to provide those laundry units. So they would provide the washer and dryer and charge money for in-unit laundry. And it could have been an all-in-one unit installed in the kitchen in an island used to do that for one of my clients. It was an import brand, but it was the only one available that I could get my hands on. It was a compact that would fit under a counter and inside a 24-inch wide cabinet space. Slam dunk. Easy money. Could only wash small loads. It was a condensing dryer, so it vented into the kitchen. So if you couldn't put it underneath a Formica countertop, Unless, you know, it was properly prepared to receive it. Kind of like when you have a dishwasher under a Formica countertop and it's just pushed back against the wall a little too far and the vent comes out and it just takes that particle board and swells it up and flakes it apart over time. Kind of like that. But in the right space, it worked. Same thing with compact, stackable laundry with a dryer and a washer in a closet. Couldn't do venting to the outside because it was on an inside wall. But, again, the condensing dryer was a big deal. However, you had to have the right door on there 
because no matter how many times you would tell a tenant to leave the door open while the laundry was washing, they wouldn't do it. And then the whole closet would fill with mold. And then you, as the property manager, would get the phone call that this is terrible. Why is this happening? Did you read in the use and care instructions for your t apartment when you moved in that you had to leave the door open while doing laundry? But they don't care. Even if you, again, even if you keep the security deposit, now you have mold. And one lesson that I wish I had known before I started selling these things is it is worth the time in probably 85 to 90% of cases. Number one, in 100% of cases, it's worth it to put a louvered pine painted door there in case they do close it. The second lesson is tear all the drywall out and put mold resistant drywall in. Purple board, green board, blue board, whatever brand it is, I don't care. Mold tough, mold armor, mold resistant drywall is the way to go. I don't think you need to go to the extent of tiling it or putting in a, a curdy vapor barrier waterproofing system or anything like that in there. But a real good drywall with a coat of like Zinsser 3, uh, 321 kills something as the base primer and then a decent top coat of paint in a semi-gloss will save you so much money in the long run. Anyway. But the in-unit laundry is great because it's optional and you can charge whatever, $50, $75, $100 dollars a month for providing those appliances for your, for your tenant. Now there's something to be said for having laundry on site as well. I can't believe in 2023 I'm still talking to people about coin-operated and the amount of labor involved versus return when compared to everything being digital. But, again, here we are. I used to avoid coin-op boxes like the plague. And when you do an actual study of the providers of coin-op services, you don't actually win? <laughs> You do make some cash flow, and you, you can, when things are going right, make some money off of it. When you compare it to keeping it in-house and doing everything digitally, digital cards, providing supplies at the dispensary, all, all the craziness that you can get into in doing value-add and adding NOI, CoinOp ain't great. And I know there's a bunch of people who are going, oh my god, I make so much money on CoinOp. I mean, yeah, okay, cool, if you are good with paying yourself like 20 bucks an hour, I guess. If you're okay with people cutting open your machines and stealing your money. Okay. Whatever. But I'd rather just have a credit card system on the wall with a bunch of blank cards that you can sell and charge for where they can swipe their debit card or their EBT card or their credit card and buy stuff. And then they can use that same card to buy supplies and single serve packets. And then they can swipe it on the machine. They can set up an auto recharge function so that it taps into their credit card or their bank account every single time that needs to be refilled automatically without them having to do it. You don't have to have a human being involved in it at all. Completely automated, other than the initial setup and teaching people how to use it. But this is what differentiates the ones who scale and the ones who don't. In all things, the more hands that are in the cookie jar and the more points of potential failure and the more points of exposure and risk there are, the slower and less able they are to, fit, to, to scale it up and be successful. I know plenty of people who love going and picking up all their coins. I know people who have gone, I don't want to do that anymore. It's just a pain in the butt and it's not paying me enough. Now I'm going to hire this other third party company to come in. And meanwhile, that third party company doesn't fix the stuff in time. Your audits turn up that they're not actually paying you what they're supposed to be paying you as your share 
of having those units there. The machines get old and they never get replaced. They're constantly breaking. You can make a lot more money on it, bringing it in-house and doing all that stuff yourself. And it's very little lift to your team. And you can buy a reputable brand that doesn't break every six months or three months. You can keep a couple of common parts like door latches from tenants who just pull them open and don't wait for them to unlock just in case. Anyway, I digress. But the opportunity to generate more money through incidental sales of stuff through having on-site laundry is huge. The other part is just because you have in-unit laundry doesn't mean you can't make money off of all the things that go into it. You can sell single-serve packets uh, through an automated machine at the main office or leasing office or somewhere on site and it doesn't take cash so it's all credit based and it'll spit out dryer sheets and single use detergent things and fabric softener things and whatever else goes in there whatever doesn't matter and it, and it adds NOI the margins are stupid and you pay 50 cents for this freaking packet. And you sell it for two bucks. Yes, you have labor involved in loading it and maintaining the function and all that kind of stuff. But it's pure margin. Why are you not doing it? I think that's all I have to say about appliances today. Reputable brand. Availability, repairability, new versus used, and additional sources of income to help you spike your net operating income at your property. All good stuff. Minimize your risk, minimize your damages, supply the appliances yourself, have your guys do it. Please, if you are on YouTube watching this right now, hit that bell and subscribe. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, wherever podcasts are found, please subscribe, like, comment, leave me three or four stars, five stars, send me a message, let me know what you think, podcast at tcomethod.com. Have a great rest of your week.